do. Okay, I guess we're gonna start. Shall we? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Matthias. I'm gonna be presenting this workshop in agent-based modeling. And yeah, final year PC student so in in the end of the summer. Uh, this is the last portion of my work, and I think I did put the agenda on the Slack channel, which is basically going to try to understand, I'm uh, not so deep level, but what is agent-based modeling? Uh, and you may recognize the term agent and immediately think of reinforcement learning, and it's not exactly the same. So we're going to touch upon that as well. Like what is RL, uh, reinforcement learning? Uh, how is it similar to agent-based or how is it different? How can they be used together? And what are the trendy tools that say, or more established and standardized tools that you could use for do both? Uh, either you know independently or actually uh, jointly. Um, so the disclaimers here is that uh, there's not going to be a lot of textbook definitions. I think I only have one uh, from a, a quote from a paper. So I just wanted to be an open discussion. If you have a you know a better grasp of agent-based modeling, by all means, correct me or chip in as much as you want. Uh, I'm going to show you what the very last stage part of my current code from my last project, uh, which is an open AI gym environment, which we'll touch upon that later on. Uh, it's not fully finished, so there's still some things um, that needs to be implemented, some, some cleaning perhaps, uh, it's a quite an elaborated project. So also any suggestion is recommended if you want to donate coffee, I just put my preferences right there. Um, but yeah, don't add me because you tell coffee is much better by the way, just, just saying. Um, does, does everyone here know about how to order coffee in Singapore? Maybe, uh, Matthias, you can explain sure. what so, you're talking well, about. But he is Italian, he will get an espresso, so <laughs> you can't order espresso. <laughs> I'm joking. I, yeah, if, if for the ones that, that don't know, coffee is local, local coffee, right? So all means uh, actually no, no condensed milk uh, or no evaporated milk. And kosan means empty Malay, so no sugar. Uh, a pen is just the, I think it's a Hokkien for, for iced. Uh, otherwise, you can use bean, I think, which is just Mandarin. Um, Coffee, less sugar, ice. No ice, no, no sugar. No sugar. No sugar, no milk, ice. So black ice coffee. Like motor oil. Yeah. Like <laughs> forte. It wakes you up, so that's nice. Uh, all right. So first of all, let's start with just right ahead with what is uh, AVM. So the agenda is actually on, on, the bot, on the top, so you can see that. So the textual definition of agents, right, in this context, is just anything that is computer generated, like a simulation, something synthetic, that has some autonomy, right, to do some actions in a constrained environment. Uh, and you will do these actions because it's interacting with the environment and somehow that affects them. Um, it, 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 it's able to like gather information from this environment somehow, like interaction, maybe they have sensors, feedback, and so on. Um, and this is like the textbook definition, and it's very vague because actually AVM is used in many domains, in public policy, economics, transportation, built environment. So it's not really just for, for us, uh, but if we want to contextualize this for us, so what is that obvious agent that we will be using often or, or not? So Straightforwardly, it's just the occupants, right? We can model people and say whether they are in a space or not. And transportation-wise, we make them walk through a specific street, right? Uh, it could be buses even, like cars could be more agents in a city if you want to really evaluate how that traffic evolves or whatever. Uh, but why would we like to use this, right? Why do, why do we care about simulating these random things that we can just look at the window and see actual occupants walking down the road or see cars? Uh, well, simulation allows you to just do vastly more <laughs> in fast less time. So this could be useful because you're able to understand the effect of many of these people or many of these agents and how they interact with each other and the, its own environment. Right? If you want to, let's say you want to see the impact of, we, we had, I think it was 90 bus drivers that were down with COVID in Singapore. Right? So buses actually slowed down in terms of the, the arrival timing. So if you want to simulate, oh, what, what will be the scenario if double those drivers are down? You don't want to wait till that actually happens in real world. You can simulate that with agents. So each bus could be an agent. You just, you know, create, let's say, 180 less of them. So you want to see the whole effect of what these, these, these guys could, could bring into the environment. 
whatever that environment is, right? I just said, in, in, this, in this case, it will be the city of Singapore. You can make it just a building, uh, campus, whatever you choose. So hold on just one second. Um, who, out of everyone here, anyone has any experience with agent-based modeling? Raise your hand. A little bit hesitant, hesitant yes. hand. I know some about it, but I have not. Well, you played again. around with the idea. Exactly, but not, yeah, not hands on. Well, nice. Miguel, as well. Same as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought that was your PhD. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I just um, in my presentation. Anybody on Zoom who has played around with agent-based modeling? Oh, Ed, Edgardo. Edgardo, yes. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about your experience? You're, you're muted if you're talking. Hello, you can go. you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, hi, I'm Edgar. You can call me Gary. I'm from the University of the Philippines. So I'll be doing PhD with uh, Philip in UAL. Great. And yeah, uh, my master's uh, thesis was on using agent based modeling uh, for building evacuation scenarios. So I've been, I've had some, some, experience using or doing a ABM. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Nice to meet you and, and good to good to have uh, some of your experience today in the workshop. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope to learn also from everyone. Excellent. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to get a sense of Don't worry. The, that's a that's a great start. Skill yeah. the skills levels or interest level. I guess everyone's interested because you're here. <laughs> Um, right, so I think Garla just mentioned something interesting, right? You wanna one use case could be, yeah, how a building could be evacuated if this many people behave this, this way. So, from what I understand, there are like two ways to look at ABM, uh, roughly. So, there you go. So, one is like space based approach, you want to see how the impact of many of these agents have on a specific space. Uh, Actually, I think Edgardo's point kind of makes sense here. Like you want to see the impact of many people evacuating from a building. Like will they, I don't know, run against each other and they fall down the stairs. People will actually try to take a lift. We're not supposed to do that, right? So you want to see the impact of not just one person, but how many, or not just one, just one agent, but many of them. And they can be different, right? Kids, uh, pregnant ladies, whatever. But overall, there are a bunch of agents interacting together. But your whole point is uh, specific space, building, city, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this, I put some references in each slide if you want to dive deeper into that. We have some papers actually from, from people in the room as well <laughs> that explains this. Uh, the other way is to just shift that lens, right? Shift that focus of what if I care about specific people? I want to see how very specific type of agents impact a room. Like in our case, for example, let's say we, want, we have these very, very picky people, expats who haven't really acclimatized to some temperatures here in Singapore, let's say. And so you want to generate a bunch of them and see if they'll be comfortable in a natural ventilated building. You know that tolerance might be different from Singaporeans because they haven't grown up here. So it, you, maybe you can really hire a bunch of experts and have them as, a, as an ex actual experiment. So you simulate those profiles of agents. So now we're shifting the lens, right? We maybe we're interested in this natural ventilated building and so on, but the emphasis is on the type of agent, the profile of this specific agent and how that actually will impact, the, again, the whole environment, our understanding of the environment and so on. Um, and again, I keep using the word agent, right? So don't confuse this with, with RL because uh, they do, do use the same term, but in a slightly different manner, or it means differently actually. So let's just jump at that uh, first for some context. So what is RL? And uh, I'm not gonna give a, a talk about that. I have another question. Yes. This is a huge tangent. <laughs> sounds, sounds like something we'll do. Who who all here has played City Sim Same. City? <laughs> I knew Farm, it. The Sims. Raise yes. your hand proudly. Oh come on! You didn't play The Sims or Sim City. I played uh, Theme Hospital. Okay, Same. fair enough. Or Wool. 
World of Warcraft. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess so. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> Are these agent, is this agent based? simulations are these agent based models you think in your opinion in citizen yeah because like you let's say you build a, a fire fire station right so you don't control exactly the characters in sim city uh, right but you know that they have certain behaviors or rules if there's a fire they will go and they will turn off put out the fire and they could only walk in certain roads and you have to you as the overseer you have to then make that road to accessible and stuff like that what about like Pretty much all video games in general. Mm. Well, if you don't con don't have an actual control on them, they're not agent based because they don't have autonomy. Like in WoW, like you have to a certain degree, you can control some of those units. You pick a character, or you right. move them here and there, right? right? You make him attack that character or not. So the the character itself doesn't have a, autonomy necessarily. What about but, bots that are your opponents? Those are in a sense, yes, it could be agent, uh, but they. Um, they, they actually, I guess you can consider them agents, yeah. The construct is on topic. Yeah, the, <laughs> the bots, the bots will be agents because they have they have certain rules so that they know how to play the game and they know to go after you. But how do you simulate, actually, how do you give the rules? Like, for instance, uh, he was saying that he was simulating how people run away during uh, fires. Or well, let's say thermal comfort, you want to simulate comfort, you use a model, a comfort model, like how do you, simulate a person because that's the difficult part so that's the very last point so okay. we'll get there but okay. other than that like i mean that's a that's the whole simulation aspect of that you okay. have to have those things defined either based on previous other simulations uh purely stochastic behavior you say oh they can only do these two actions which one would they choose 0.5 probability of each of them and you may then choose every every, every time step something different will happen but you don't have any control. You let the stochasticity go go and do their thing. Okay. Um, would you say agent-based modeling only makes sense if you consider multiple agents? That was the first slide, right? It's right. Um, I guess so. Although, I mean, it depends. If you by multiple agents, you mean just one single entity being an agent? Or because that then I guess yeah it's just it, it just it would just mean a simulation. There's no a lot of mm. uh, although I guess you can still see the interaction between this unique entity and its surroundings. Uh, but you can also refer us you know one single agent as in one type of agent. So you only want to see the effect of evacuation of a building of only pregnant ladies, and you and so that's one agent of a specific type. It's not just one person, but it's one agent. So I guess you can look at it both ways. Um, I cannot see, I cannot think right now on the top of my head, a simulation where you only care of, of one single person or one, you know, uh, granular Bad unit. Games, for instance. Sorry? Some bad games, you know, like Tekken or whatever it is like. But, but, but the thing is though, you could, I guess. Uh, it's not so practical though, because in those cases, actually that's where reinforcement learning comes into play. Because you don't want your bot to, you know, this one single opponent to do random stuff. Mm. Right, you want the opponent to beat you, so there's a goal that that agent should strive for. Yeah. Just beat the real human player mm. that has some learning behind it. So it's kind of agent based, but but not really because the moment learning comes in the picture, the problem paradigm changes, and that is what will slowly come in. Okay. Thanks for thanks for entertaining these these tangents. But I mean, I, uh, the reason I brought up that tangent just thirty seconds more is. <laughs> When I first started in this community of built environment research, I kept thinking, how is this different from when I was 12 years old playing SimCity on my computer? Like, could I just like have five different SimCity games running, compare the differences and write a paper about it? Like, that's kind of how, what I felt like I was doing with SimCity, honestly. So I, I don't know, this is, this is not really, very relevant to what we do, but that, that's that's just something interesting. Mm -hmm. So we can do that actually, and actually that's what we're doing in our paper. We're yeah creating different versions of that and then evaluating them. So it's not so silly, right? To it is not. I mean, the foundation is the same. It's just yeah, but it's just that the parameters inside of SimCity are maybe not as realistic as what they should be in order to do quote unquote research. Let's say, but anyway, okay, sorry. No worries. Move forward. Uh, right. So I was mentioning how RL, this is not going to be a master class on that. Uh, I'm not there just yet. Maybe by July, yes. <laughs> uh, but I will strongly recommend like uh, Sutton and Barton's book. That is the Bible for RL. Uh, 
or actually all the classes from UCL and DeepMind are online. Uh, one of the, more of them are taught, most of them are taught by David Silver. So he won, he hasn't won the Turing Award, but he has won some ACM Distinction Prize. He's the leader behind AlphaGo, you remember? And, and he actually studied under Richard uh, Rich uh, Sutton in Canada, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so just, just go and learn the stuff on your own. Uh, but okay, what is RL? Just think of it as a framework, which has been on the quote unquote market since the eighties. So it's not really nothing new, uh, but here the agent, right? As, as we got up a really interesting example, we don't want Tekken to just play randomly. There's a goal in Tekken, which is win. You have to kill your opponent and get down this health bar to zero. So you have to perform certain actions depending on what happens around you. The Tekken example is great because you know, if, the, if the opponent is blocking, if you hit, nothing's going to happen, and you might be exposed to then get hit back. So maybe you have to taunt the, the, the opponent to make him try to like unblock, and then you actually can punch him. But anyway, so depending on this of the observation you have, right, how the environment has changed, you, the well, not you, but the agent, will have to decide which action might be the best. So there is a learning process. Depending how things are, you will evaluate, maybe do this and not, and, and uh, see what the outcome is. If I is positive, meaning I get to hit him, great. That should that the agent should learn that's something positive. I should keep doing that in the future. The opposite, if I get punched, oh, maybe that wasn't the <laughs> part. I should not do that in the future. So that's what, the main difference is just that sort of learning process. And what are these main two big entities in RL or components? As we said, is the environment. Just think of that word is going to be used a lot here. Uh, but just think of it as the problem you're trying to solve or the context you're in. The environment in Tekken is literally your 2D screen where everything's happening. Um, and things can be read from there. In these computer games, it's a little bit not so straightforward because you can just use the image as the, as the observation, as features. Uh, it's not so entertaining, uh, but that is one option. The agent, for example, will be in this case, that something that will learn what are the best actions. So in the Tekken example will be those commands of the controller to like jump, hit, uh, right, no, no, right punch, left, left kick, and so on. So that will become an agent. So here's where the agent is a little more abstract because it basically becomes a software, becomes a program that will learn. Whereas in ABM, we can think of agent of something a little bit more tangible, a person, a boss, and so on. So with that in mind, how does the RL process kind of go about? So let's just take the, that's, that's not Pong, but I forgot the name of that game, but that's a CD very straightforward example. So again, RL does use simulation, at least for its very early stages. You can have it running in real life, but let's look at the simulation uh, scenario first. So in this game, right, in every simulation step, let's say every time something happens, the ball will move naturally to wherever it's going, and you, um, and it will change its position, right? It will be in the next, let's say, frame, it will move slightly more to the right, because apparently that's going, or maybe it's to the left. We don't know if it's going up or down, but that's a matter. The environment is changing. So in every time step, I will see the agent, me playing it as a human, or the, the code will actually see a new, a new image, a new frame. So with this new information, the agent should decide to do something. Even us, right, when we're playing this, let's say the ball is going up. What should I do? Should I just really already go to the, to the right because the ball is also going to the right? But that doesn't make sense, right? Because it's going to bounce back. So I probably should go to the left because maybe it will, it will bounce to the left. But what if I should do, I don't know, a weird bouncy thingy that I don't know exactly where it's going to go? Maybe I should just don't, don't do nothing and just stay on my seat. So all this thinking process of like, if I, do I do something now? I just wait till I get more information uh, to do something later. In RL, a key thing is that planning process. There has to be a trade-off between doing something now short-term and something long-term. And this is the, the important thing about how something will learn. Maybe right now, I don't know what happened in the future, so I would just do something immediately. And with time, meaning as I go and play more, I will learn that, you know what, when the ball is there, I should just stay, just stay put and see, wait for more. And after, sorry, after every action that I make, there will be some reward, meaning there'll be some sort of quantifiable, quantifiable data that will tell me what I did was good or bad. In this case, though, we know that whenever a block is broken, we'll get some, some score points. So we know, okay, that was good. And obviously when the ball falls beyond the line and we missed it, that's something bad. So we, we always have very clear indicators of like, okay, the action or set of actions I did were kind of good because it led me to gain some points uh, or the other one actually, what I did, the action itself or a bunch of actions were wrong because 
I miss the ball anyway. So these three, let's say, stages are always present in any RL problem. You look at what's happening, you decide what should you should do, sorry, the agent should do um, to try to eventually get, get something positive of a reward. Uh, and therefore, these three things are that should be defined in any RL problem. The observation are usually more straightforward because that's the problem you're trying to solve. In a building controls, well, you know all your, anything that the BMS can give you. Uh, the action could be maybe, I don't know, opening the damper more or increasing set points. So you know what things you can actually do. And the reward is where, uh, well, sorry, the actions, for example, might be also constrained by what you can actually do in a physical building. Maybe you don't have access to a set point. You can only open windows, let's say. So you still have to carefully think what are the real things I should, or potentially real things I'm only allowed to do that will make sense in this problem. And how can I get a sense of what I did was good? Do I, if I wor worry about energy, maybe my reward is, oh, at the end of the day, I might have saved this much money. Or the people inside might have, based on PMB, let's say, might be feeling in this range. Uh, which one you choose depends on how you want to just pitch your problem and how you want to tackle it. So there's no standard way to handle uh, a specific problem. And that's why even in building control, you will see a lot of slightly different nuances. People who care about energy and comfort, but they just measure comfort differently. They just use PMB, for example. And they say, oh, that's because that's the only thing that's available for them. Or PMB is too complicated. So they decided that as long as temperature is within this band, that is considered okay, and people will obviously be okay at that band. So their uh, sort of reward they're defining in this sense, and the for their problem is might be different for your take of how you want to handle that problem, which makes things a little bit complicated because you cannot easily compare uh, your approach, let's say, with theirs. It becomes a little more of an apples and origin situation. Not to mention the actual implementation might be also differently. Uh, so it's a whole mess. So that being said, what are the differences we can think of, of or at least similarities between ABM and RL? Uh, we said the word agent has been thrown around here and there. The ABM is a little bit more of a tangible thing. RL, we have this abstract thing, which is the software or whatever. Uh, but nonetheless, both you can just simulate. And RL is pretty much done most of the time as a simulation uh, first. Uh, there's very few cases of real world RL deploy. Um, but if you go actually and see the videos from Boston Dynamics, you can see really nice real time uh, RL deployed in, in robotics, which is pretty cool, which is mostly where RL has been implemented before. Uh, but then, okay, that's obviously where they overlap, where a bunch of engineering stuff overlap because it's a simulation. But what is that then? Very, very unique thing. As I kept trying to hint, the main difference was in, in learning. In RL, there is a goal, goal of learning uh, that set of actions that will lead me to the best outcome. <laughs> ABM, I'm just trying to understand what would happen if I have these many pregnant ladies in an evacuating building. What if I only have kids and they're just kids being kids? They don't go away. I don't know. So I'm mostly worried about if I create all these fictitious but maybe probable scenarios, how would the outcome look like? I'm not necessarily interested in changing the behavior of, of my agents, but just see how everything will turn out. So the, the, the main difference will be the learning process. Now, does this mean that they cannot put together? Uh, not really, because if you think about it, even nowadays uh, in our building domain, uh, we can simulate occupants at agent base. We give them a schedule to come and go, blah, blah. At the same time, we can change set points. So we can have agents roaming around with a defined set of rules based on real data or not, and have at the same time, this software is trying to learn what is the best set point for people in this room, uh, knowing that they might have this, this schedule and so on. Uh, should I push them to another room, another building, because that other building might be more suitable for their comfort? So both can coexist. And actually nowadays, that is where a lot of the literature, not necessarily in the built environment, but in, in, in robotics and even population-based stuff, uh, it's, been, it's been just trying to move towards that. Uh, any questions so far? I have a question. Reinforcement learning, what's, how, is, how does it relate to 
optimization in general, like you have optimization techniques, correct? Is it is it related to that? Is it like a subfield or is it? Well, you can use optimization techniques to come up with that best action, right? Like you, you see in this scenario and you say, okay, uh, I can look uh, my current context. What is the best um, action I should take? Should I should just wait for now? Should I do nothing? Uh, I guess it's not the best example, but in, in general, optimization techniques can be used to try to find what is the best action given my current situation. Right. Mm -hmm. There is kind of a relationship there. There is, there is. But it's not clear, like, if this, if, if these are related to each other in some, like, right. hierarchy. I think RL is mostly just always stuck with uh, decision-making and planning, because it's usually a long-term thing. If, if you don't care about, like, the, that second point of trade-off between short-term and long-term, mm. if you only care about action right now, that's kind of just a, a, a purely Markov decision process, right? You only care about what happened just before, and you don't care anything about the future. And truth, yes, RL does use some understanding of, of uh, NDPs, or my call decision processes, but that's, we don't have to go there. Uh, at the end of the day, there is some importance of like, what I'm gonna do 10 time steps later should be somewhat important. Uh, maybe not as important as what I'm doing right now, but that long-term, I should have that in mind. And so it, it is a planning. Everything that is a sequential decision-making can be inserted into an RL problem. And is but it's a black box model. Like you don't tell him the information. Like in this game, you don't tell him the physics of the game. No, but, but you can learn it. The, right, exactly. Okay. Well, yes, you, you are not telling the physics. I'm just giving you the whole image. And then, you know, as a, a, a visual model can, can just learn something from the images, can learn the position of the ball and whatnot. Um, and I don't have to give it exact. But for instance, for a building, you could give him a simplified model of a building. And then the learning will be to optimize uh, some uh, coefficient uh, then uh, uh, tailor to the specific building. Or in a person, it could be, okay, this is a model of the person. I mean, in anything, like even in this game, uh, you could give him uh, some uh, uh, physics uh, or some, uh, you don't know how much the ball will bounce. But if the material that the engineer has uh, designed in this game, uh, but you could give him some physics and then the model could optimize that. But in this case, it's just a black box model. It could be both. Like, think about it, the, the building example was good because you can give it a fully energy plus model, uh, which you, you can think is like, you know, white box, uh, and then have the agent, I mean, your, your model, the RL model will generate an action. And you, in your simulation of energy plus, you put that action in and you see how it evolves, right? Yes. And the same information, you send it back to the RL. So you're actually dealing with a physics based model and there are, the RL model may not know that, but it, you know the data you're coming from is like ground truth or not. But at the same time, you don't need this. This is, I think this is what you, we can call model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, it's also model-free where you, maybe you don't have the energy plus model because you hate energy plus, like some of us. Uh, you just have historical data of a building and you, you're lazy, so you just have a linear regression model of the building based on data from BMS. And you let that be the building. So you let the, the controller, the RL controller, change the set point, and you just put that as a new input for the linear regression. The linear regression spits something out, and you send it back to RL. It's still a planning process. Yes, your model behind the building is maybe bad to your, for your own standards, but you're gonna still want to try to learn what's the best set of actions, regardless of how that environment looks like, if it's real. No, but the problem is that if the model is bad, then what you learn might be wrong. Yes, but what if you just, it depends also the, the data availability you may have for how you want to see this model. Um, did you have a lot and you, it's feasible to have an energy plus of that? Great, but unfortunately, maybe that's not the no, case. No, the no, time. but the, the issue with energy plus is also that it will never be exactly this building. Even if I simulate this room with energy plus, uh, will never be the thing. But you could technically use the reinforcement learning uh, uh, to, because you have historical data of this room. Uh, Mm -hmm. You have uh, what your model is picking out, uh, and you could change some coefficient inside the model, which doesn't have to be sophisticated as energy plus, uh, but we could use this approach uh, to optimize the coefficient, uh, not using the white box of the energy plus, uh, we think is perfect, but it's never going to be perfect because you never know the how much uh, air leaking air is coming from outside under the door and so forth. Uh, but 
could we use this approach also yeah. to optimize the building, the, the energy plus or a simplified remote? Yeah, okay. you can see whatever your environment could be based on a physics based model or some data driven stuff. Okay. And that's where it's like, I, I, there's a really nice slide for this is Professor in U Washington, uh, Steve, for his name. Uh, his Twitter tag is uh, Eigen Steve. So he teaches math, like Eigen vectors. Uh, and he has very cool, uh, he teaches engineering, but he does a lot of um, deep learning for, for control. And he talks about this overlap of model based, which is a real physics based models versus model free personal learning, where you only have data. You may not have this really understanding of how things are. But if it's data driven, just just make something out of that. Which is true. Maybe it's not you know as detailed as you would like. But if it's the only thing in your problem that you may have access to, you might as well yes. just do the job. Sorry, Martin. Yeah. Yes. So no problem. Yes. So is the difference between uh, optimization and reinforced learning somehow related to the complexity of the environment? For instance, I give you an example. For instance, chess. No chess. You know that basically the state space is. I mean, compared, you know, to the Go is relatively with a low complexity, which you can, of course, afford, you know, like exploring the whole state space, you know, uh, for each, you know, uh, movement, which with the Go, of course, it is not possible because the complexity is so huge, you know, because you were mentioning, I think that reinforced learning was at the uh, base, I um, mean, the basics of the uh, alpha goal, no? Yeah. Is what you mentioned earlier yes. on. Mm. So do you think that somehow, you know, you would use optimization when the complexity of the environment is not that high, or at least you can afford to have enough, you know, uh, uh, resources, you know, to explore the whole state space while for more complex environment, which is, I think, what you are trying to describe now. You would need more of a, like a step-by-step, -step, you know, mm. learning and exploration of the complex environment. I think that, that's an interesting point. Um, I don't think, I guess, as I, as I was trying to say before, I don't think there's separately like optimization is one thing and RL is another thing. But you're right that, yes, there's a point where if, if, your, if your state space is such so big that you cannot just do it with a normal optimization technique, RL can shine. And yes, exactly, the chess example and the Go example are, are prime candidates for that, right? I think, was it Deep Blue that defeated uh, Gasparov some back time ago? And that, that was, not RL, I think. It was just a big ass supercomputer. It was not really RL, uh, I think. I could be wrong. Uh, but then AlphaGo is based on, on RL. Now, it doesn't mean that RL doesn't do optimization. The nature of enforcement learning and this sort of trade off allow it to, like, it doesn't need all its, its space to come up with a feasible solution. Uh, however, the inner workings of that, at the end of the day, they use neural networks and you have to optimize the training. So you use optimization techniques to facilitate the training. But the optimization itself is not how they find the answer, right? There's a lot of just forecasting of, of the network itself. But you can argue that, well, you use stochastic gradient descent to train. Right, so yeah, that's and so that's optimizing for you know for the best weights. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially thinking of the you know the mean max algorithm, you know the right. mean max algorithm is something of course you can apply on chess because you know okay. yeah yeah absolutely. But definitely on the go, you know that there were strong limitations due to the state space, you know and. I was just wondering yet yeah, whether it was yeah, okay. I found a good Reddit thread about this where they're saying RL addresses sequential decision making problems where the rewards are sparse and temporarily downstream from the decisions. Bayesian optimization is also applied to sequential decision making problems, but here the rewards are dense. Every after every decision, we see the results of the experiment and know how much we progress towards the target. Mm. There's no a credit assignment per se. So yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty new. I like I like what direction you're headed. I think they're headed in a different, slightly different direction, but yeah, I think it's the same thing. So but what you mean translated is in chess, after every move, you have kind of a reward because you know why you're moving. Yeah. In that game, you have to wait for 20 seconds before the wolf comes back. Right, and, and, the, and, and the rewards are sparse, so there's different decisions that would result in nothing happening. And even in chess, every move you don't eat your piece, right? No, but in, in every move, in every move, then uh, you change the probability of the other person winning the game. Like here, till the ball goes up, I can almost don't move and that's kind of thing. Yeah, that's it, it does it. I don't know. It, it's. I mean, in both cases, it's. The word is sparse. Here is like sparser because yes. you say you have yeah, to yeah. wait more frames. But yeah, it's okay. That was a tangent. We can come back to. No, no, <laughs>
<laughs> no, but to answer that question, I think you have to introduce the notion of the Q function, because that's the main thing that's unifying optimization in RL is the approximation of the Q function. So Q function is the approximation function that determines the costs of the actions you're taking at one time step. So that allows any control algorithm, so whether it's optimization or RL, to quantify if I take this action right now, what will it cost me in the long term? So RL is a bit different than optimization in the sense that you have this framing of agents, um, but, but the whole uh, learning process behind it is the approximation of this Q function, which has been done in optimization a lot as well before. So it, they're, they're very similar. It's the framing that's a bit different. Hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I was struggling if I put like Bellman's equation and stuff, but <laughs> that's a little bit too deep. Uh, but I strongly recommend David Silver's uh, slides and uh, presentation. He's playing very well. And he even has one podcast with Lex, Lex Friedman, uh, also, if you like that. Um, but great. Oh, sorry, we were here. But it's, anyway, any, any more questions from the chat or Zoom, I guess? I saw, I saw Mark Wood turn his video on me. Mark Wood, do you have a question or? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Matthias. So the the main goal is to define the reward and the, the punishment uh, uh, parameters, right? So for the, the for the RL to be to be to be right. Yes, one, one, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if I get this correctly, one main issue or, or task is to define the reward. And that will sometimes make or break how you handle the problem, right? Because the reward will eventually yeah. allow the, the agent to see or to evaluate itself if it's making a good job or not. Yeah. And, and then we, we try to maximize the, the reward and minimize the, the punishment. Is there a punishment part of the? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, if you can, if you're maximizing the reward, then if you cannot try to not get punished, oh, okay. they can be seen like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I, 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 find, I find some people do the, the RM uh, aligned with the, with the optimization problem. So, for example, or the genetic algorithms or something like this. So, the, uh, for example, they populate a very large uh, population of uh, agents. Or maybe uh, I mean, uh, if they try to uh, to optimize car racing or something like this, so they populate uh, a very large population, and then uh, they try to maximize the the, the longest distance uh, that uh, one of these cars will uh, reach. So I think the yeah, uh, so this could be one uh, one input to the to the RL problem. Um, yeah, but I mean, even if ABM you don't learn, it can. Because it allows you to understand the effect, you can sort of use that for quote unquote optimizing something. One of the very early examples I gave was people were using generating a bunch of agents to determine what the right right sizing of the HVAC system would be in a building. They just want to like push it, how many people could fit in here, uh, or they have an idea of how many people they needed and what's the right size of the HVAC for this many people. Right. So it's not it's not a learning problem per se. They just need a bunch of people with different you know thermal masses or whatever, and then see just Try right. Try and try and try and try and error kind of which size is the better. So that are optimizing for that, but not necessarily in a in a learning process. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Thanks. No worries. Uh, all right. So I guess we should continue. Um, great. So that's mostly the theoretical part. Uh, now there's some going to be some hands-on. We're getting there. Uh, so this is where I like to introduce it to OpenAI. There's a link in there. And this is a quote from their own website, which OpenAI, well, OpenAI is the company. Um, they developed this thing called OpenAI Gym. So OpenAI Gym, or just Gym, is an open source interface to reinforcement learning tasks. It's a library that provides easy to use suite of reinforcement learning tasks. So again, not really that <laughs> clear, a little bit vague. Um, so why do we need this, right? Why though? Like the RL has been in the market since like the 80s with Saturn and more people and stuff like that. There's already PyTorch or TensorFlow. You may ask, why should I learn this stuff? First of all, this is not PyTorch or TensorFlow. Those are deep learning frameworks that allows you to implement neural networks or those, if the own optimization thing is blah, blah. OpenAI Gym is actually something that's slightly different. It's also a framework, but it's not with that angle. The thing with RL though is like, you know, it's pretty cool. And in the recent years, actually, 
it's become very general, right? We're not playing just Go, we're playing StarCraft, we're playing Dota, we're solving building controls issues. So wherever you need, as Titan read from the Reddit, uh, a sequence of decisions, this can be applied. You just maybe tailor your problem in this lens and you could apply RL here if you need to. And so many of these approaches, uh, deep, you know, deep QN, um, uh, self-actor critique, uh, stuff like that, have gained a lot of good results in a vast of difficult problems. Like the, the bots from StarCraft have no way of playing against like new bots from Dota 2, for example, right? They're like as good as the top players that win millions of dollars in the international, which is the Dota 2 tournament. Um, so they're becoming really robust. They're, do, they're all this research actually paying off. Uh, but it do take some time, right? It's just 2020 right now, 2022. This is back from the 80s. So there was a moment where all these new algorithms of how to learn the best set of actions independent of the problem took a lot of time because there wasn't really benchmarking stuff for this. Uh, there was no, let's say, building data genome problem. There was, uh, sorry, data set, or just any platform where the same problem remains, remains or the same data is constant, and then let me apply my own flavor of algorithm to see if I can solve this. Uh, that means there's a lack of standardizing what the problem could be, or in RL language, what the environment could be. Should we all play StarCraft? Well, maybe they don't have the computer um, power. Maybe they should all play Bong, the play I, or, well, it wasn't Bong, but any of those computer games, right? But obviously, people can implement this thing differently. So they want st stable and standardized libraries everyone can use, so there will be a more fair uh, comparison. The classic example computer vision people use is uh, ImageNet, right? It's it's been labeled for so many years, and it has really pushed computer vision research on that sense because everyone has access to the same data that was labeled the same way. It has its train and test set data sets like that, blah, blah. RL needed something like that. So that is why OpenAI was like, okay, let's do that. Let's build that set of suite of library and framework where all the problems, classical ones, have been implemented. And maybe you can do your own flavor as well and share it because it's open source. You might as well just share with your peers, share with your colleagues in your field. So everyone can then apply their own flavor of control or R classical control or RL that can solve this potential problem. So that was- I have a question, oh. but you're gonna describe it. No, it was just basically just that, uh, that's where Jim comes into play. And I always thought of Pokemon whenever I, I, I read about Jim and obviously Pokemon Red is the best Pokemon, but that's all. So Jim, like why Jim? What, I mean, Jim, because Is I guess common? Sandbox was already taken, I guess, and Sandbox might not be too... So it's like uh, Sandbox. Okay. The, the, the meaning behind this, yeah, it's somewhere you could, you, somewhere you could train and just like simulate shit. Oh, uh, because they're training. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. OpenAI, what, you said it's a company? Yeah. What does that mean? I, I mean, I just Googled it. What, they did the research. What do we know about OpenAI? What is it? Uh, I don't know if they came before DeepMind. I guess so. Uh, Looks like it's a nonprofit. Yeah, I think it's just an organization. Because um, I know DeepMind eventually went, they got absorbed by Google and they actually are for profit. Oh. Uh, but OpenAI, they are. GPT-3 from OpenAI? What? I think so, actually. What's I'm not sure. sure. GPT, the language. The language. The language, language, no, it's the language, language mode. mode. That you write code, you say. Write a Python function that uh, calculates the Fibonacci number, and then it writes the function for it. Yeah, it's not oh, okay. okay. You can uh, say, I, so. I want a card for a React component, and it's blue. Okay. And it does, it writes the code. I think it's that one. It's a research lab thing. It's a research laboratory consisting of for-profit company OpenAI LP and its nonprofit parent. Founded in, by Elon Musk, Sam Altman, Altman, who collectively pledged $1 billion in 2015. Okay, that's what opened up. Okay, got it. Oh, and the background is the founders are afraid of, of, of AI and they want to, right? They want to understand it like, better. Yeah. Yeah, but funny enough, they don't. In 2019, they received an investment of $1 billion from Microsoft. Sam Altman is the former president of Y Combinator. Okay, okay, got it. And it's funny how they push all that open source like Jim, but they, they don't want to disclose anything about GPT-3 uh, and all this stuff. So. GPT-3. So language but you have, you, have, you have kind of to pay to use it a bit. Generative pre-trained transformer is autoaggressive language. Okay. Or you can have a conversation with someone. 
Like you can say, you can ask question and it kind of beeps. Oh, wait, this chat. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. That was a tangent, but I didn't realize that it was a company or organization. But I think I've heard of it before. Anyway, cool. All right. Um, yes, Pokemon Red, like always. Um, great. So, it's an open source software, right? So how does it look like? Let's just take a screenshot of a custom one. Uh, don't worry, we'll actually get hands on. Uh, I took this from the link below because there's a thing that is slightly somewhat nice introduction. So remember what we just said, right? In any RL problem, you want an environment, you want to take some actions, and you obviously want to get some reward based on those actions, right? And we know this happens every time step of the simulation. So basically what Jim does is allows you to have a custom environment. You define it, let's say, you, you create your own building problem or you take one of the classical ones that this thing already holds. Uh, then obviously there's some initialization as, as usual. You want to create the, the, let's say the 2D screen. You want to have, as Tariqa was saying, a model of the building, right? You want to launch here your energy plus or you want to actually uh, uh, train an LSTM based on historical data from BMS. You'll create the environment however you see fit. And then where the magic happens is all gyms have this function that's called a step. Basically means in every time step, something will happen, right? And this is the key where whenever you, if you do your own gene environment, this is where most of the effort will go because you want to make sure that, okay, right now it's time zero. I just started, so nothing is going on. Time one, what should have happened before to, be, to arrive to where I am? It's, it's something that did, did my controller took an action that's going to affect me or did the weather change outside and therefore my building might change its <laughs> inner set points or whatever. Um, right, so actually just, just to show that a little bit more hands-on, uh, if anyone can already install that, we're gonna use an example that OpenAI has, which is a classic car pole problem. It's a car with a, like a hammer, just like a stick on top. And in that thing is gonna balance, try to balance itself. That's implemented there, so we're not gonna worry about defining the environment, but we can understand the inner workings of how gym itself kind of works. Mm -hmm. So let's just, if you guys have planned it, let's go to terminal. Uh, is it visible on Zoom? Yeah. Great, so hopefully everyone already um, cloned that. And if you can clone it, you will see right now here, right? Let me move. Oh, what is this? What is this magic? Hi. All are pretty. Oh yeah, so I, I, this is gonna be also my moment to show off Vim because I don't like any other IDE. So bear <laughs> with me. I just wanna flex using Vim and terminal because I think it's far superior. So don't can add me, but yeah. Uh, I might fail doing this real time anyway, but doesn't matter. I think it's cool. Uh, anyway, so. This is what workshops are for guys. Mm -hmm. uh, as we just said, you just clone the environment, right? I just say it under this name, admin AVM demo. Let's just go to the folder I just said on the screen behind, right? We said, let's go to point three open AI gym. Okay, so let's just go there. Uh, and we can see there's three files, right? So let's just open one of them, but I wanna open and then when I execute them later on, flex time, I can just divide my screen. All right, so let's, let's just- What was an ID? <laughs> what did you see some sort of shortcut to do that? What? Yeah. Wow. Another thing with Beam is like, you should not use your trackpad. That tiny seconds you use for using your yeah. trackpad, it's a waste of time. You should just use keyboard. Let's say I don't want this, I want actually horizontal partition. I love it. No. We're nerding out. Like All right, so, <laughs> oh, do you need to, if you have a, a virtual environment, use it, or, or you have already installed your libraries, great. I'm gonna launch my virtual environment, right? Uh, so it's already there, AVM demo, it's already launched. So now let's just go and look at the first file, which is called, called carpool example one. Uh, one, okay. Right, so he, okay, let's, we, let's see a little bit more onto this side. Okay, uh, it usually we import Jim, obviously. Uh, here's where, as I was mentioning, we need to define our environment. Let's want to use something that has already been created so we don't worry too much about its inner workings. Uh, we assume it works and it, it just, it's like that. We're going to use a card pole game, as we just said. Um, you can just Google it, but it's just, again, a brick that has some wheels, go to the left or the right, and there's a stick that's going to be trying to be balanced. Now, what do we do reset? Oh, basically just, you know, we're starting from scratch. So that's all what reset does. 
reset dust. And again, remember, sorry, RL is a simulation thing that happens in multiple time steps. So let's just do a big ass for loop because that is simulation, right? It's just for loops. Uh, let's define a thousand times. So that's our time steps. Um, it doesn't mean anything other than a hundred different points in time. There's, we don't have right now any, any understanding of, you know, is that every 15 minutes or 10 minutes? We don't really care about that. Now render, this is just, so we actually see the game. This is a, because it's a game, we might want to see a screen that actually showcases the, the car and the, it's thingy. Um, not all problems have this, right? In a building, we're not going to have a 3D model of the building and so on, but let's just have that for the sake of fancies. And as I just said previously, step is one of the most important functions here, right? Because it's, this is what defines what happens in, as time goes on every single point in time, discrete time. Uh, we're doing basically selecting an action, uh, which in this case, because it's a car that goes left or right, our only actions are move left or right. Because uh, we are trying to balance something. Uh, and as you see, we're doing sample, meaning we're not really doing anything other than randomly toss a coin and go to the left or toss a coin and go to the right. Uh, so let's go back. I should even, never mind. Just close so this. the carpool, like the what you import, make, uh, is you import the game? The, the environment. In this case, is the game. OK. Yes. But that is, for example, if we want to create something custom, we can call out another file where we okay. have created our environment, which we will do later you on. You have Anaconda install to use environments, right? Uh, you have to install no, no. You can have five. Oh, okay. but I, I just had it. Uh, like Anaconda is, is bad because you have config, but you, you can, if you don't have Anaconda yet installed, you can use Python. Oh, uh, let me also. I thought the environment. I think I thought there active... two different environments you're talking about. Yeah, there? I'm talking about the Conda, the Conda activate. No, that, that's for the, the Python environment. Yeah. And yeah. What's the environment in your file? Oh, so I think if we go, it's uh, environment macOS. So you actually need to do Conda. I think it's open AI. Uh, sorry, comfort learning. Yeah, I just activated the comfort learn environment. It's no, he does not have uh, an environment. You, you what you could do is also the environment to GitHub. If you want, I can send you uh, the instruction how to do it, uh, like on your computer, the environment. I think you're talking about a different environment than. So, so OK, so there's a Python environment, which is where all the libraries are going to use. Right. Right. <laughs> and there is the, the environment of reinforcement learning, which is what the problem is going to set up. So the environment in reinforcement learning, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> the Python environment is like, as long as you have the libraries installed, where I should be in this file, yeah. just install these libraries, you should be good to go. Uh, I had to add one more, by the way. What? Yeah, I, I got an error because I didn't. didn't uh, OK, <laughs> which one was it? But yeah, I, I... Uh, OK. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, but with that added, it should be working. Great. So OK, so now let's. Let's run that. Let's do Python. No, let's do again. Where is it? Open AI. So Python. Oh, it worked. Look at that. Typo. Let's do one. Oh my God, this is so cool. And since we're taking random things, they just it just bites off the, the window, right? Because we're not actually constraining that the car should only be in the in the specific window we're looking at, whatever. So it doesn't really help, right? It's, it's okay. A failure. It's a failure because we're taking random actions. Now let's look at the other file then. Let's do an example two. So a little bit more meat here. Uh, actually, because I'm zooming in too much, I think it's a little bit. All right, let's go here. So, so in Jim, you, what was the name of that, that function type? Step? Step. Okay. That's what happens every single time that we move. Every single discrete time we're moving forward. You can, you can control the speed of that, right? Well, every, every step just goes one time step forward. By speed, you, you, may, you may control how long you want this to be run for. Oh, OK. Right? So now let's, let's add a little bit more just flavor into it. Actually, I'm going to close this so you can see the whole thing. Right. So let's define the concept of episodes. So this is interesting because this is where actually I had a little bit of struggle because in the building domain, it's going to change this. But for the purpose of this problem, let's think of episode as one full run of a simulation. So for us, I'm one full run of the game, of the problem. In our case, the game. So if, the, if the, the whole pole falls down, we lost the game. So that should be a full episode. So the episode should fall, should end when that thing falls down. Uh, now, how many time steps should, should the episode should try to run for? We can also define that. 
So now it's a, a nested loop, basically, because we want to run for many episodes. And we know that in each episode, the, uh, as much time that can happen are, let's say, 100 time steps. Now, obviously, we know that an episode can end sooner than 100 times. Because what if I do nothing and it just poof, falls down in, let's say, 30 time steps? That's fine. It would just be over. Um, the, ignore these two guys first. This actually is not useful right now. Uh, let's just look at the for loops first. OK, now uh, we do reset because, as we just said before, we want to every new episode, we want to start again. So that's why we reset the environment every single time. Now, so you don't learn anything with the reset? No, you, you still learn. You're still learning because this is just resetting can, the conditions, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. It's like exactly. game over, start again. Exactly. Now let's look at the, at the uh, for loop for every time step. So render because we just want to see stuff, how it, the, the nice game. Again, we're just playing random actions. We're not really doing any logic behind moving left or right. Again, we're just randomly choosing left or right. Uh, as I was mentioning here, step is a very important function. I can zoom in this more. Very important function, right? Uh, an observation, now we're actually looking at what's happening at every point in time in the game. So this particular game, step actually returns uh, observation, so which is here, right? Observation is a four tuple for this game. You can define your environment to return whatever you want. This game returns four. How do I know this? I just go to the documentation. Uh, so it returns the velocity of the car, right? Uh, then the well, the position, the velocity, and then the angular position of the pole itself. Uh, a step also returns a reward, which if you think about it, makes sense because every time time passes, you want to know how everything looks like and whatever you did, how did that affect your reward? So it makes sense that action, sorry, the step actually gives you some reward. Now there's also the thing called done, uh, which is actually making sure that did, are things okay? Can we still, can the next time step continue? Like what if we're just, the pole is already falling down, this done will actually go to false because the game has ended. So we just cut off this, this episode and restart again. Um, so at the very least, every step function should give you those three things. How everything looks like, reward, uh, sorry, observation, reward of like what, whatever you did, how did that affect your new conditions? Like was that something good, was that something bad? And if things are still okay to take the next time step or the episode is finished and you should start again. Info is something unique that each OpenAI gym environment has, just, just I guess, just debugging stuff. Uh, and obviously, the thing you pass to act to a step is whatever you want that action to be. Uh, this also could be nothing. It could be none. And then you would just see the whole environment behaving as you, as you think, which is a hint. Because what if you don't want to learn anything? You just want the environment to evolve. Kind of like agent-based. You just don't take any action. You just let the environment run with things happening inside. Since you're not learning, kind of becomes an AVM problem because you just want to see how mm -hmm. things happen. Uh, and you will just keep track of the reward. Can you pause for just one second? Is anyone here trying to run this on their machines but is completely stuck or having problems? Okay. I'm running it. I'm running it. Got it, got it going? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. okay, keep going. Sorry. Right. No, that's okay. Uh, and then this is just some 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 boilerplate code to like actually display shit. Uh, so anyway, now let's run. No, let's do Python. Oh, there's some wait, someone. I'm running into. Okay, Winston. It, all right, it works. Right, we do. Winston got mock food's got a thumb up. Oh, okay. That's all. I forgot. He just gave a thumbs up a bit ago. Okay. All right. So let's just run the stuff. Uh, Carpool two now. Now, why is it coming back? Because we are resetting every episode, right? Before, we didn't have episodes. We only have run this for a thousand times. So the car was just all the way down, right? There was no logic understanding of when does the whole thing ends or begins. In this case, we're saying like, no, no, no. Every time, actually, the pole falls a little bit too much, we start the game. And that's why we're printing that as well. We're printing that right now. And that's a new episode. Exactly. Every time, get, the, car, every time the car goes back to the middle, it's a new episode. We get done uh, as soon as it reaches. So uh, yeah, I think one thing I, I forgot to mention was the, the way this has been coded, like the way OpenAI coded this stuff, is that the moment the, the pole falls between falls like 15 degrees to either side, the game should be should stop. Uh, uh, and, okay. and the moment the, the car itself moves way too much to the to either side, the game should finish, meaning you lost on both cases. 
Okay. So that's why it's, this guy, you see, it comes to the side again and poof, goes back to the middle. Yes. So as you can see, reward every time the post stays, stays fully, fully direct, you get one point, you get one reward. So something within the gym library is defining the, the, con the context, yes. right? The weight yes. and the gravity. And, yes. Okay, that's not, okay. And we're not diving into that. Someone has done we're it. We're just like setting some parameters. That, exactly. Okay. Because and at the end, they wanted that to be the goal, right? You don't worry about how this environment was implemented. You just want to try if your way of learning the right move left or right uh, is better than anyone else's. So you don't really have to dive into my, if my physics of my carpool are correct. No, I just want to make sure like the way you are moving the car is better than Adrian's lap, something like that. So the, so far, this is like just all simulation. Yes. This is all simulation based stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we are not even specifying how to move the car. We are just getting a return. So like we're specifying a step and we're- uh... the, And we are randomly sampling an action though. Hey, we're just randomly sampling an action. Right. So here's the thing. If, and you see the action space comes from the environment. And that makes sense, right? The environment should define what is possible to be done there. What is possible for any agent to do in your environment? For this environment, the way they have coded is that the actions are only two. Move left or move right. Mm, okay. And we're getting a random value. Yes. Okay. That's we're just doing dot sample. Mm. And I, should, and I guess you could print, if you remove sample and you print the action space, they should give you, I guess, just zero or one, I think it is, or minus one. I don't know how they're defined it. But for this problem, they have only have two. Let's say for a building control, control problem, if we have a more, a simple set point controller, maybe our actions is just plus half a Celsius, minus half a Celsius. Maybe those are the only con uh, actions my environment defines. Again, the agent doesn't define the actions, right? It's just what the environment tells me is allowed. And therefore, again, that comes in play of why they wanted to standardize things, because they want all those things to be boilerplate, fixed, and then people should spend from the R community their time figuring out how to best take the actions. What about the terminology here? Episode, step, is that something that was created? I think, no, that's from the RL community. Is that, that's like a community terminology? Yeah. Kind of episode to me sounds like what what if your what if your simulation doesn't have a failure state? So that you could define a, a shorter time for that. Like for example, it, you that's first where I I wrap, kind of had issues to uh, wrap my head around for buildings, right? Right. It's very hard to find an episode in a building, right? Because like oh, the building just like dies or whatever, right? Right. You just time goes on, right? The time comes and it's just like the building should operate forever. But the failure state might be... Well, you don't have a failure state. You don't have a failure state, yeah. though. Like here, but even here, we don't have a I mean, we, we set a failure because we don't want to waste the resources as the pole falls down. Uh, but that, uh, I mean, correct me if yeah. I'm wrong, but let's say that you simulate every hour, then uh, here we want to stop at uh, if the pole is falling because we don't want to use the computer when right. the pole is falling. But, and we don't keep on to keep moving. But the building, you just run... Uh, a thousand episodes will be a thousand years, a thousand runs. You could do that. And then we will do, yeah. But you can have failure state, like if, if your temperature is outside of reasonable bounds or your energy consumption is too high or... You could define that as well. I, I don't know if the literature, they do that. Um, but you don't have the temperature, sorry. You don't have the temperature outside because the temperature is what you control. Is yeah, it what you control? This is the... the huh? No, but you control the set point, but you can still measure the... Input. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. And, like, here, there's nothing is being learned right now. No, is there? So we're not learning anything. It's always doing the same thing every yes. loop. It's like Groundhog Day. Yes. Well, we're randomly choosing left or right. Yeah. So we're not doing... The, it's not exactly Groundhog, but Groundhog, but it's... But you could... We could learn, and that's where we're going now. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's... Uh, my I'm question, interrupting you before the nice be, part. It's going to be answered by the next thing. Uh, yes. So we could close Vim and open again, right? But again, we're flex. You can use a fussy finder. So let's just go to uh, card poll. Fussy because the moment you type, it shortens the list. That's why, guys, you should use Vim. You can do it also in ID. I'm joking, Matthias. But you don't use... Try, like, <laughs> choosing things in your trackpad, ah, waste of time. Um, it took me like a three hours figure out how to exit them once. Yeah, uh, that, way, that way you can. Q, whatever. Colon Q, W, Q or something. Yeah, sorry. 
No worries. Okay, so now we're actually loading Torch. So if you know, this is PyTorch. So we're gonna use some neural networks. Not now, but just, just in a second. Uh, ignore, ignore the neural network class. No. Uh, uh, how do we go down? <laughs> ignore this for now. Let's just keep going down. Now, again, the same environment, right? We have uh, Jim, again, same things. We're defining some very simple neural network. Don't look at it just yet. What things are the same? Uh, simple actions. Okay, actually, let's change this to true. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's just put true. Autocomplete, by the way, you can also have that, obviously. Um, it's better than IDE because you, you use an LSP, you use a language server protocol, which is far better. Uh, but in any case, <laughs> um, again, code hasn't changed that much. Now we just have this if where we're no longer taking random action. So what is this? Select action simple. So we can scroll up or obviously beam, go to definition. Oh, we're there. So now we know what, because this is a cheating problem actually, because we know the dynamics of this poll problem. We know if it's going to the left, we should go to the right because we have some understanding of real world physics, right? So we could hard code that stuff. We know if the observation of two and three, which is I think the velocity, yeah, above, if it's on one side, compensate and move to the other. So we are kind of cheating because we do have an understanding and let's just hard code that. So we're telling our quote unquote agent to like, don't learn, just, just do this every time you, you face this. And let's see how that actually works. So let's close that, let's run three. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, How does this help the learning process, Matthias? This is not learning at all actually because we have hard coded stuff, right? You can argue that here, the learning was done by us because oh, we right. understand the physics of the environment. And we hard-coded that in phrase control. And yeah, it's a dummy control, but it works, right? Right now, the poll is, is actually there for a long time. See, our, our average reward was actually, even it lost a bunch of times. It's still going to the side sometimes. Uh, but overall, it's making quite a decent job. But the episodes are still going. We're only printing every 10 episodes. So we see it's still going. It's not losing that hard. Or that easily. Mm. I'm just gonna wait for the episode 10 to be printed so we can switch it to actually learning. Uh, see, actually, even that sort of full, foolproof logic didn't help it to steer to the side because it wasn't enough. So there's some there's some parameters here about the angle of the pull, but also how far it gets to the side. Exactly. The side. Okay. See, so we had an actual reward of average of 91. I mean, on average, 91 time steps, the whole thing was straight up. So what if now we say, okay, that's easy, but like in, not in every problem, we have full understanding of how to cheat based on the observations. Mm -hmm. So what if we allow the actual thing to learn? So let's comment out the um, simple actions yeah, here. Let's do false. Uh, uh, so how would this would change? Great. So now let's, like, let's pay attention to here. So we have a policy. So this is a term that we didn't want to introduce, but just think of that. That is, this is where the agent will learn. A policy is just a mapping. If things are this way, I should take this action. All is that. The simplest way of reinforcement learning is called tabular learning, because it's all this a table. It's just a table. If this happens, take this action, right? Just a one mapping, one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, but obviously, if things become more complex, as you see, this mapping is just a function, right? What else can learn functions? A neural network. So let's just have that. So we define policy network, uh, which if you go to it, you know, just, just very simple one. Actually, it's a little bit big, unnecessarily big. I just did it that way. So you can just flex that you have it, I guess. Uh, and obviously, as any neural network problem, we have the optimizer, some a small number for the sake of uh, numerical computation. So gamma. So gamma is an interesting value because for reinforcement learning, this is what determines how much importance would you give to future stuff. Uh, if it was gamma one means you only care about my act, the importance of my actions for the next time step. Uh, the smaller one, the smaller numbers will mean you put a weighted importance to things that you have done uh, previously, sorry, no. Mm. And so on. Uh, I didn't have the formula here actually, but anyway. Uh, that's the main thing that changes right now. We are not going to do simple action anymore. Sorry, I'm using my mouse, I should not do that. Uh, you just select any action. 
And now everything remains the same. We're having the same observations, the same reward, blah, blah, blah. Um, actually, everything remains the same. We just have, again, some login information to make things easier. Now let's let's try to run this again. Oh, sorry, it's fine. Uh, and things will be different. Oh, wait. No, gamma in this case is used as a reward function uh, in the reward function. So if we go again, actually, where is that? Right, see, gamma is now just, this is uh, on the reward. So this is going to be a weighted value uh, that's going to, it's going to weight the rewards in the future. No worries. Uh, okay. Wait. Hmm. Python 3, great. Now, you might be disappointed that it's failing a lot at the beginning, but it's because the network has random weights at the start. Um, it's actually, you can argue that, oh, my, my first simple actions, when it's falling to the left, turn right, was working better from the get-go, and you are right. Uh, but you can argue that here, oh, as time goes by, my average reward is increasing. So there is some learning of my neural network or what is the best action given what I'm doing. Maybe it's not as fast as I as my dumb solution at the beginning, but eventually, as time as more episodes go through, as there is more time for the network to learn and update its parameters, it should converge and it should provide a way more stable thing than my dummy response. Because even my dummy response was uh, averaging like a hundred, right? We are fifty episodes in, and we're getting close to that threshold. So with time, we should be able to reach that and maybe even beat that. And also, this is an extremely simple solution. You could actually apply deep Q network functions in here, and it will solve the problem way, way faster. Uh, but it's just a little bit too much for this problem. So that's why a simple field forward, it's kind of doing the job already. Whoa. So this is where the learning comes into play. This is where if actually you change that with the gamma number. If you change the gamma number, it will it will affect the way. Yeah. Uh, by default, by practice, people just choose 0.99. Uh, because say one uh, is no future. You don't, yeah, you don't, you don't get about, uh, so yeah. 0.99 sounds very close to one. Right, but it will still affect the way that okay. as time goes on, right, as, as more time goes learning, some actions still have a little bit of weight. Okay. And you can see, yeah, our average reward is actually increasing. So, so this model is getting better and better. Mm -hmm. Would you call this trained model a surrogate model then at the end of the day? It's considered a surrogate model because inside gym, there's a model of physics, right? There's a model of the, 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 the pole and the movable thing and all these things, right? Right. And in, the, in your simulations, you're creating a model that accounts for those physics. But like you said before, we created instructions because we know the physics right it's easy but you didn't have to do that because you trained now you trained a model right, to right. do that um that's my understanding because people in the building building industry for example they'll create energy plus models they'll create a million energy plus models and they'll run all those models and then they'll train machine learning on those models and they call that a surrogate model mm -hmm. right is that that's kind of similar to what we're doing here right yeah, but but I mean those it's models. Useful. I'm not saying it's not useful. I'm just saying like, is that the cat? I don't know. Is anybody? No, because that's control. Yeah, this is control. control. Okay. Surrogate. My understanding for surrogate models is like, you yeah you. You come up with a model that, that does the exact same thing of the of the real thing. So it's like it's for me. So I understand surrogate models as digital twin, and there's a real thing, and you just want something data driven that can replace. Got it. it. Okay. That's how so I the see control it. element of it. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Isn't this okay? So now I don't understand. Isn't this the favorite model? Of the, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, Rule-based control he implemented before. The surrogate model. The rule. Okay, got it. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. Okay. Okay. Although it's learning by itself using. But you don't have to teach it. You don't have to like tell it what to do. It just learns. Okay. Exactly. That's good. There. I mean, so it is a surrogate model of the what he first like define the left and right. So well, this is it's, it's not exactly true because it's not trying to learn from the rule-based control that Matthias gave the example of. It's just learning from the environment. Yeah, yeah it's just learn from data. Okay. So it's different. Okay. It's different. All right, let's stop this. Um, cool.
uh, go back to the presentation. So that was, that was fun, right? Because we actually did some learning. We, we show how to use OpenAI Gym and did some learning. Great. But, you know, all in all, it's cool. But what about actual HBM? Because at the beginning, we, is this, what we just did is just RL. Where was the ABM? It's supposed to be an ABM, right? Fraud. What about citizen? You were saying how that's a huge thing in our domain. Matsim for transportation. That's just not really cool anymore. That's not what the community is pushing forward. Sorry, Martin. Um, so this is where- Martin's tool is not even up there though. This is called CA, yeah. It's too heavy, it's too heavy. Too overpowered. Still not cool though, is it? It's like Steve Buscemi. I believe so, uh, Mahmoud, because you have to steer, I mean, all the engine controls, right? You have to learn that stuff. So I guess so. Yeah, rocket science, right? Literally. Um, booster landing upright on a on a floating <laughs> platform that's got to be yeah um yeah i think also there was a game called the uh, lunar landing it was also trained on uh, something similar to this so, uh, yeah, yeah. Even, uh, yeah i think open ai has a, an environment that is like landing you have just two thrusters and you have to like balance them so your your rocket can land in a specific terrain that was a game when i was a little kid yeah yeah <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you have the thrusters, right? So the same environment is implemented in OpenAI. So you can yeah. make some model that learns that. Yeah. Um, right, so coming back to Come From Learn, which is the tool I'm going to pitch to you guys. And hopefully, you will use it later uh, sometime. So looking at the same example, right? We, we just saw this. This is the skeleton. We just saw a tiny toy play example of the card pole. How does it match us in ABM? All right. Well, if we just focus on the step function and let's not do any action. We can just simply define agents to behave somewhat differently at each time step. And if this, again, we obviously the learning part, we have a simulation engine. It was pretty much just about a for loop that we can do stuff at every action and every time step, I'm sorry. But I know the immediate question you may have is again, why though? Like you're, you're just using for loops. How is this different to like just have my own Python script and do it exactly the same way? Mm -hmm. Well, gym environments are actually becoming more popular. They are interchangeable. They are standardized, standards, standardized, and they are becoming more embedded into the building community. There is, as you may know, see to learn a competition that is already going for its third year about demand response at the urban scale. They're doing it again this, this year. year. I think so. Okay. Uh, there is grid learn, which is now a more grid interactive building uh, with like some, some renewable energies coming from uh, Colorado Boulder. I think Kiri Baker is behind that project. There's actually GEM and Energy Plus, which I kind of hate, but it does work. Mario Bradges lab in, in CMU has used it quite substantially for his work. And it was created by a former student from Kipo, uh, but Jan Jan, he made this environment. The downside for this is that it's a cost simulation engine. So you have to run GEM and energy plus at the same time. So in every time step, you're tapping into energy plus, performing the action and getting the observation. Um, you could do that with CEA. You could technically do that if you want to. I don't like co-simulation, but right? so for it. Right? <laughs> Possible. <laughs> so those things are actually doable. And even a recent paper in buildings was like, we still don't have enough benchmarking for building controls. There's still not something unique that I have my building this way, I have my building that way. I wanna see what's my best way to control the chillers, the third point, which way is the best one. They ha we haven't reached that in the building community just yet. Uh, like work done by uh, actually, yeah, Alfredo, uh, no, that Argentinian professor for UC Merced, they use their own gym environment. Alberto, like Alberto, so Alberto Serpa, Canepa. Serpa, Serpa, Serpa. Alberto Serpa uses his own thingy. Uh, Mario Berges uses gym A+. So they have different control algorithms. Both have shown to be to work quite nicely, but again, still apples and oranges. So that's why I'll try to push you to use uh, gym environments because the framework remains the same. You know where to plug in your controls, your situation. So what, what does it mean that CityLearn is a gym environment? It just uses that library gym, the, the gym library, and it's in that framework? Or? Right. It's basically defined this way. So in the environment, it's a bunch of buildings and their own entities, so like heat pumps and chillers and whatnot. You have, it, it, they define what actions you could make for each building. So it's not like, oh, I'm gonna control only building A, not building B. City Learn is like, no, nope, these are my buildings. These are the only things you could do with my buildings. So City Learn is a is like a context that that includes 
a theoretical scenario of homes and appliances in the homes. Yes. And it's all this big, huge chunk of code. Exactly. And then you clone that. What do you do to that environment? What, what is the competition part of it? The competition part is that what is the best way to take different actions to then reduce consumption across so the you whole? You have world. to define, what do you define to create action? You, you define- The agent. Because remember that in, in, okay, let's go back to here. So the way, remember here, right? What was the main difference that a lot, oh shit, this is not. Ah. Uh, what was the main differences between the second and third example that would allow us to, to learn and to see the change, right? It was just this if statement. We changed the way we were taking actions, okay. right? And who defined the actions? Uh, well, in this case, nothing is in there, but usually the action is, is we, we have an agent equals, I don't know, uh, get action, let's say, and then we pass the observation. <laughs> Awfully type, but you get the idea. So we have a Python class, that we give them the observations and that agent will somehow spit out a good answer. And then we said, hey, good answer, get, did get this to the environment. And that is what we just did right there. We saw the difference between hard coding some dumb solution that worked and then do some learning. So in City Learn, you just change that. You just basically put in your agent file and that, that will magically learn these better actions. And each team will compete, okay, but what is the best way then? To get those actions. And then in City Learn, you were submitting a, a, like a standardized chunk of code that defines your agents, and then they would run it. Yeah. Did they, did they run it multiple times, or was I think they do for like multiple like multiple episodes and multiple also like four times or something like that. Yeah. So you would send it, and then they would tell you how well you did. Yeah. They had a leaderboard. Usually the way those competitions, the our competitions work is like, yeah, the line of code will be like, yeah, agent equals select action, uh, let's say, and then observation. And they ask you to like, oh, uh, send us a file. I mean, uh, send us a file. Ooh, okay, never mind. Send us a file with that file. So if you go into my agent file, it's something like that. You just define a class that has to implement the select action function. And then you return this. And you've got your you have your approach here built into this. Exactly, it could be networks, hard coded solutions, whatever. Is there any platforms that do that automatically, like the the whole gym competition paradigm? Like Kaggle, you upload just prediction, right? Right. I know there are. I know there are because there was a competition actually, uh, which was pitched by. Um, Carnegie Bosch, the new research institute in CMU, well, not CMU, but Pittsburgh. Uh, Doesn't Kaggle have? There's uh, actually. Don't I, they have competitions that are like simulation competition? There's one in Slack that I share with the other students for autonomous racing. Uh, where is our channel? Uh, I think I share it with like. Winston, Mahmoud, and those guys, and I forgot the name of our channel. But but they are platforms that do that. Kaggle itself, I don't think they have that. Um, but I've seen platforms where they will do that simulation. So you don't have some, you don't have a PhD student running the files for you. It has been automated. Oh, there there is something with Kaggle simulation. Oh, I haven't. Uh, anyway, never mind. Never mind. I was just curious. Uh, um, cool. Right. So, so then somebody who want who wins city city learn, they are opening that that file. They like they they share that file and it's shared with the world. And they write. I don't a, know if they, they did, write a paper I don't about it. Probably write a paper. I don't know if they disclose the solutions though. Uh, I didn't see that for last year. Really. Uh, but what I saw for the first year or second year, no, first year, was that the winners or three, three yeah, the, the first three teams. Were encouraged to submit their solution to RLM, and that's what Andrew can did. But I paper about it. Yes, for the workshop in Builds. Cool. But I don't know if the pub, if, the, if that solution file was publicly available later. I don't. I'm not too sure. Interesting. And I think from Sultan's side, I think they don't have the evaluation automated. Like there's someone yeah. behind the scenes just running things. Um, Jose, but, right? I think Jose, the other guy from from Gregor Hens's group. The, the Indian guy? Yeah, Gregor is involved, yeah. yeah. So they are holding it again. Yeah. They are. So there's this website. Uh, AI crowd, yeah. I, I, 
I yeah, know. so this was, this was a challenge started by, I forgot to compete, by, um, yeah, by CMU, but people from LTI, Language Technology Institute, from CMU, uh, and actually also co-pushed by Mario. Is this explicitly based on Gem, on the OpenAI Gem? I believe so. I mean, I don't know what they'll do exactly behind the scenes, but you need to submit some, uh, I think it's Gem-like, in the sense of like, you assume those functions, step and stuff like that, uh, are exist there. And it will give you a reward observation and so on. And now this is also a what is it called? A workshop in uh, IG International Journal of Machine Learning. No, never mind. ICML. I think it's a workshop in ICML. Uh, hmm. And see, Mario's Mario's students are are also involved in this stuff. Jonathan Francis and Binchin. Which is the one with the control paper for from Bill's best paper. So they're uh, they're actually shifting to autonomous driving now. In uh, who's who's lab? Mario's. Mario. Oh, to 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 driving autonomous driving. Oh, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, okay. So we have buildings all figured out. So they're moving on. I guess so. You got a NASA project, remember? Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Okay, I realized you have half an hour. I thought it would be done, but uh, right. So, okay. Having said this, so hopefully you're somewhat convinced. Why? Um, I have a quick question, but just sorry before you. Um, back to the code. Um, in the so in the select action function, which is not the simple one, you input now a model and an observation. So that model is. Is the Q function, right? It's what yeah. does in this case will be the Q function. What tells you which is the simple neural network. Exactly. Okay, got it. Got it. Um, great. So hopefully with that in mind, so what is this thing I'm trying to pitch you in sell you in half an hour? So come for learn. So the problem remains the problem is this is the following. We have buildings, as we know, and zones. And we have occupants in these zones. And we know we, we want agents, abstract entity, to learn how to Set set points, maybe turn on ceiling fans such that occupants are okay and they are feeling comfortable, and hopefully we save energy in the in while doing so. But what is different from this problem that has been tried to be solved from for many years so so far is that we want occupants to actually be somewhat real. We want them to be based on real data and not just generic binary occupancy counts or a stochastic occupancy presence. We want them to have quote unquote behaviors. We want them to have real psychological data as background, but also thermal comfort data. Like if temperature or conditions are this way, they actually have a ground tooth label they can provide us. And this will set us apart from many work right now. And it's only dealing in this comfort evaluation via PMB or a temperature band, uh, which is most of the times not generalizable per se. And the agent will learn. The, in, we're hoping that the agent will learn, are you in the correct zone? Maybe you will need to move around to feel okay. Maybe we need to change the set point as well. Not only move you to room B, but also increase the temperature in room B. Um, we're not there just yet. <laughs> we're, I'm finishing the coding from this part. Right now, you will see the work of purely the ABM side, which kind of nicely aligns with this workshop. But the goal is to have both. And this is where I was mentioning how the Nice thing about Jim is that if you're trying to do something in uh, ABM and you have maybe some thought of doing some planning in the future, that's not have to be controlled, just call it planning on time, time dependent decision making, Jim will allow you to do that because the framework was already envisioned to do some learning as a decision process. So you have the advantage of not only doing something that's getting more and more standardized in the built environment, but it gives you the exit to add planning if can be something you could add to your own problem. Uh, so again, hands on. Let's just try to look at the. This is just the overview of how Confluent works because the files are a little bit long. Um, so as you can see, we do pretty much the same things. We load the environment. The difference, though, right, is we're not. We're actually using a file here. You will see if you plunge the thing. There's a file called confluent.pi. Instead of loading something existing like Carpool, we are using our own file. So that is what using custom genes looks like. Uh, again, the environment has its own definitions. What are the things you can measure observation? What are the things you can actually do because of the action space? Uh, obviously, right now there's no learning, so there's no really actions. We load agents because we want to generate people. This is where a lot of the, uh, oh, sorry, this is the learning agent. That's where there's a, a big to-do. Uh, 
the, the actual agent base happens inside the environment as well. Uh, similar to what we saw with Carpool, we reset the environment. We assume the simulation is not done just yet. Uh, we don't really select any action. This is just a placeholder that I put there just in case. And similarly to before, or well, unlike, unlike before, it's very hard to define an episode in buildings, right? Ideally, we just want this thing to run because we want buildings to be operated as long as they can. And so this is why it's basically just a big ass while loop. Now you say, oh, Matthias, it actually this is going to end because hopefully done will change to true sometime. It will, but actually the way this simulation works that it would only end when my time horizon has ended. If I want this to be run for a week, done will switch to week once those time steps, sorry, done will switch to false once one week worth of simulation has been done. Uh, so how does environment actually looks like? So, you know, very, very simple stuff as we saw, we showed before, there's initialization of stuff, like what are the things you can observe based on real data, actions you can do, don't matter right now, we create, this is where we create the agents, we create occupants based on real data uh, used from experiments we've have had before, such as dorms, such as ENF. Right now we only have ENF data uh, because, in this example, uh, because ENF data is public. Uh, obviously, we have to define the step function. What actually happens in every single point in the simulation? And this is where the ABM kind of comes into play because we want to see that, okay, right now temperature is so-and-so, and if there are these people in this room, how will they be feeling? We can look up uh, these, those environmental conditions to their own historical data and see what is that potential grand truth thermal preference label they could have. And that is what we sample if we want to take into account, uh, if you want to measure the thermal comfort, which we actually do. And reset because you want things to obviously, you know, start again for the next simulation. Um, so as a blast, uh, we have 20 minutes, so I think that's more than fine. Let's just run the current version of Comfort Learn. Uh, and we need to change folders, so we go to Comfort Learn, I guess, yes. Uh, so I work with Comfile. Okay, let's take a look at the Comfile then. Uh, so let's just do, this is just, in my opinion, best ways to handle big projects where you want to test different scenarios. You have different com files. Instead of changing things inside the main code, just change, create multiple configuration files, and it just loads these different variables. As you can see, this is just, you know, when I use nth data, it has gonna, it's going to have five people. They're going to come and go uh, randomly. That's why it says a stochastic timing. And that's pretty much it. We're going to run for a week of worth of data. You can see max steps for my definition of this environment, each time step lasts 15 minutes. So that's why 672 is gonna be roughly a week. Now we have this thing cost, which you can think of as the, kind of like the opposite of reward technically, like the punishment Mahmoud once mentioned. Um, but in our case, it's just, it just how we want to keep track of how things are. And there's this thing called UNC, which I wanna explain just a little bit later. Uh, the agent, again, this is just a placeholder because there's no actions at all, right? So it's called baseline, but as you, I think I show you my agent file, right? It's nothing, like nothing. <laughs> so I basically return non-actions. So that's why nothing is happening. There's no learning at all. Um, I could open comfort learn, but there's nothing worth showing that way because it's just so big. So let's gonna run this sucker, uh, Python. Uh, I think that's, it. oh, sorry, main file. And with that config file, which we know the tolerance number, I'm gonna explain that in a little bit. Uh, but let's just run this guy. It should work on the first try. Uh -huh. Yes. So now we're unlikely, not unlike, again, unlike the cardboard game, I cannot render stuff because I guess I could, but I'm just too lazy. So I'm just going to print my observations and which people are, which five random people are in my room. And as you can see, it just already ended. So one week of simulation was actually quite straightforward. However, as you Remember, nothing is happening. We're just letting data from this, from one building called zone one, just go at it as it has been recorded in time. Sorry, Matthias, um, uh, you, you're printing some, uh, what do you mean the, the building is running? And the simulation is running, meaning okay. time is going from midnight on a Monday, or well, yeah, zero hours on a Monday, all the way to midnight on a Sunday. So you get the end people. Mm -hmm. the, you get the ant people, the, you load the database ant. Right. Okay. And then you randomly assign them to a space. Yes. So right now it's, uh, 
sorry, I, I, I lost you a bit. And also I couldn't understand what you were printing over there. Like, oh, so yeah, you, I mean, you get the data from the end people. No, so you have the end people. So the end people is basically people completing a right here right now survey, like the survey saying uh, how, how comfortable are you? Yes. So at every, at every step, okay. And every step, what is happening is uh, beforehand, it generates how many people I ask him. In a config file, I said generate five people. Okay. Great. They haven't been, they just, the system knows, or the environment knows there's five people that exist in this world. That's okay. all. Uh, and then the simulation, and then obviously I create one thermal zone based on historical data. So I have BMS data worth of six months of one building, and I make that my environment. Then I, and because it's six months, I can randomly choose whatever week I want. That's the matter. Okay. And then simulation starts. So every time step, when every step function, time will go forward 15 minutes. And I, I have decided that it works from Monday to Sunday. So the very first time step will be zero hours on, of a Monday. At okay. zero hours of a Monday, in this building, nothing's happening because it's zero hours. No one is in that building. I know there's five people that exist in this world, but right now in that building is just whatever, whatever the BMS told me that Monday at zero hours. Okay. Are. Time goes forward. May, let's say it hits 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time for some of the people to arrive or all of them. That timing I, has been, is, is was generated as, as I requested stochastically. So I don't know, maybe there's a, that time was a time where people came in. Um, and that's one of the things is, is gonna be printed there. And therefore these five people will come into the office okay. because that was randomly selected at 7 a.m. the time people will come. Mm -hmm. And they will be there. And the environment would, again, be just the historical data at that point in time. Time will keep going. But because there's people, I can actually check, OK, those are my conditions in the observation. And there's these five people. I know who those five people are. So I can check at these conditions what your historical data says your thermal preference label could be. So I go back so and basically what just you mean look you up. know what the people who, who these people are is because you have developed a model for these people. Those people are not a model, they're actually a user from a data set. But they don't always vote it at 7 a.m. They, they be... don't, but they they have that's why I don't come time is not a state for me. Okay, so let's say that that person voted at 25 degrees. Yeah. And at 8, 7 a.m. there is 25 degrees. So you know that uh, that person will be comfortable, not comfortable. It will be, yeah, but it, it will be the closest in environmental conditions, the responses. Okay, the problem is that uh, that person, uh, okay, l l we keep it simple in this case. Uh, this yes, person... I know the point I you're making, I, no, no, I get no, no, it. It's I just, like I the, the, the fact that uh, that, per, that response could have been given in a completely different context. No, no, but that's and, perfectly and time, fine. I, fine. I completely agree with you. Like. So you are, uh, let's say you do an linear interpolation. That person at 24 degrees feels uh, slightly cold, 25 comfortable, 26 hot, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you know that if the building is 25, that person is comfortable. Mm -hmm. If the building is at 24, he's cold. Mm -hmm. So then you know all the four, five people and you know how they're feeling. Yeah. Perfect, okay. Uh, so then the next oh, step, uh, the next step will be to minimize the number of people who are uh, uncomfortable. Right, but that will require learning. We're not doing learning just yet. Okay. Right? We're only seeing... So what you were people. printing over there was the... Uh, when you run that... Yeah, As here. you can see, basically it just says, oh, current action taken, none, current states. So I should just print in what my actual observations are. It's not... It's not a, we don't see the name of the columns, but yes, in the code, this is for just debugging purposes. I know this is the day of the week. <laughs> this is, I think, Set, uh, some of these are temperature, humidities, and more, more stuff like that. So it's just whatever observations my environment is giving me. Uh, mm. It's just depending on the problem, some of them are easy to visualize. The carpool, I can actually see how the game looks like, right? For many of these building problems, you won't be able to do that because yeah. it just that doesn't make sense. No, but right? the visualization is not important. Like, I just wanted to uh, understand, and now everything is clear. So for every person, you basically understand if they are comfortable or not, mm -hmm. but you're just printing that value at the moment. Yeah, okay. at the end of the day, nothing printed will actually be useful anyway, because it's a simulation, right? We want to see yeah. the end after things have happened, because it's ABM. We want to see the effect of all these things happening. Uh, now, let's look at how the results will look like. This is the time I will use notebooks, because I think it's a little bit easier to show you. Just now, otherwise, being will be better. 
Now results, right? Okay, so this is what I mentioned with you. What was UNC about? So UNC was a metric that was introduced first in a in light learn paper. Actually, I think it's also a term used from HVAC, I think, for like occupant use hours or something like that, uh, which is just a ratio of the time of uncomfortable conditions divided by how much of that time you've actually been in there. Uh, meaning the lower, the better. You want to minimize the time you've met, you've been uncomfortable. So let's just load, and also, I don't know if you noticed, but probably maybe I, I spoke a little bit fast, but there is this value that was set tolerance 0.35. So what is that actually? So if we look at our data set, this is the ratio of, sorry, this is the ratio of our responses from our users, right? Again, this is across the entire data set, so we are not really distinguishing at which temperature they gave these votes, but let's keep it simple. Some of them overall provided, you know, 80% of their votes were okay. They were not requiring cooler or warmer and so on. As you can see, many people have different, let's say, conditions. I decided to call this tolerance because let's say they are nth one is like quote unquote high tolerance because most of the times, 88% of all their votes, they were they said they were fine. Other people, and Sue was like 0% of the time, all the time he was called. So there's, a, there's low tolerance in a sense. So the way the agents are being generated are, I'm going to use this as a threshold. Anyone below 35% of no change votes will now be selected as candidates to generate virtual versions of themselves. And why is this important? Because this knob allow us to then generate different types of users at any point that we want and how many we want. It is true that, oh, but you only have, let's say, how, uh, 13 users and only, let's say, only two of them are below 30, like 28 and zero, I think. And well, 12, only three of them. So can you only generate three potential users? Not really, because if it's an agent base, you can spawn 20 of, that are similar to these three, that are based on these three, but it doesn't mean you can only generate three. But at least this knob of what I call tolerance uh, will allow us to distinguish uh, and actually give us this selection, what kind of users I want to create, which is the whole point of ABM, right? See the effect of a specific agents or a specific type of agents. Uh, and if we look at what is the results, for example, of having, I think I, I had five people that has this tolerance for one week in this building. And here we can see them. And this is the UNC value, which I cannot scroll to the right. Uh, where we see that, okay. Oh. All right. Uh, this is a UNC, we saw the lower, the better, right? So we can see how, okay, these are not that bad. They're close to 0.5. So half of the time that they were in the office, they were feeling okay. Sure. The, their time was still fixed, like they arrived and left at random times, but they stayed throughout the uh, throughout those windows in the office. So is that good or bad? That's debatable because it, since we have the, the simulation engine, we can change that. We can add another stochasticity to say, you know what, you come at seven, you leave at four, but you can randomly leave for like a couple of hours. And we can add that behavior if we want to, because we have the simulation engine already. Even though it's called simulation engine, it's just Python code, then we can just move mm -hmm. around however we want. And if you run it again, actually, which I already did just to save time, and so again, my typing is horrible, you increase that tolerance. What if you have more people, people that actually are supposedly able to handle more stuff? Um, makes sense that most, that these people that are, again, randomly selected from, from, the, from the overall pool of participants that have a wider thermal comfort preference, uh, thermal preference tolerance, they're actually gonna feel slightly better because they they're, they're more accustomed to support this range of temperatures. Um, this is not reinforcement learning because you see, we're not really learning anything just yet, right? We're not really telling them to increase set point, decrease set point, move to one zone or another. This is purely ABM just because we're seeing the effect on the people, not on the system, but seeing the effect on the people of what would happen if you were in these conditions. Uh, and this is where it becomes cool from the gym perspective, because the way the framework works, we can change how the building looks like with just one file, because it's all historical data. And we have put them in a building that is kind of like SD, SD4. What if we give them data that looks like a more air conditioned building with the exact same people? We'll be coming to analyze then this, this overall effect of this type of people in this type of building. 
So it allows us this all, you know, uh, just match together, mix up different conditions without really diving too much into code, without really, you know, pumping up Energy Plus and define a whole new building from scratch. So based on real world buildings that we can have BMS data, we can see real world people, how they will feel. And I think this is miles better than, uh, depending on the use case, it's miles better than Energy Plus, all the sophisticated tools that are not really how the world looks like. Uh, and they have the additional perk that you can do control later if you want to, because it's just defining something that will learn the actions. And it's just right there. It's just one more piece of Lego you have to put. So everything, the, the, the basically playground is set. You have to pick the right. Like, right. One problem is though that you have real world people and real world data, but it goes back to the previous question. Like how do you match uh, like, uh, you are not matching that person in that real environment, like because that person didn't complete the survey at that time. You're finding the closest one. Yeah. And the problem is, uh, uh, it depends on which parameter you're finding the closer. Like Ideally, the, you want that all the data you have for your real building should match the data that your occupant gave. When he, when he or she recorded the point, because then you can actually match all the features. Yeah, that like your air temperature, relative humidity. Air Anything speed, that you record yeah. that you can then use for matching. Okay. And the less you use, obviously, the you know, a little bit more of a wiggle room there is for error, but it doesn't necessarily have to stop you to put correctly, pick the choices condition on each side to match them. Uh, another approach, oh, sorry. Uh, we, we, we just have like eight more minutes. Yeah, that's why. We're in the workshop, so. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know if you wanted to do, it, but you, I think it'd be good if you guys. No, no, it's, it's actually super. It's actually and super dive into those details. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just went my slides. Then is like I think the gyms are very versatile. They're a good and a, a promising option for purely do agent based because you can see it's actually not that complicated. And if you want to eventually then put some planning into it, let's just not call it personal learning. Just some planning, decision making, time based decision making. It's right there. You don't have to build another tool. You don't have to look for other software. And it's open source. And you could try to use Vim because I think it's cool and it's much easier. I think we can dive into some of the comfort learn you're going to be presenting in May, a month, like a lot of months, two months from now. Well, it's almost April, actually. But yeah. yeah. Because I, I see it as a super interesting thing, uh, yeah. a very interesting thing. I have a lot of questions, but uh, yeah. If well, just have to... you guys can keep chatting. I just want to make sure we start the Buds Lab meeting on time so we can end on time and, and things. But if you guys want to go down the rabbit hole a bit more, like later, tomorrow, whatever. But also, Matthias is going to be presenting in May, early May. Or no, it's the, like the yeah, first lab. Thing, in the Buds Lab meeting. Oh, fair, fair. In the Buds Lab meeting, and that's all it's going to be about is comfort learn specifically. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but but no, I wanted to give us some time to have a little bit of a break too. So bathroom break real quick. Um, thanks, Matthias. You were afraid it wouldn't fill two hours, and two hours is not even yes, enough. It's not even enough. Oh my gosh. But when the topic is interesting, is always you need more time. So um awesome job, Matisse. It's recorded, so everybody if you, if you can if you can post it on uh on our Buds Lab YouTube, that would be great. Um the workshop, as you can see, I, and I didn't really introduce the workshop, you just kind of got started. I'm I'm sorry about that. But the, the workshops uh are this kind of style that you've decided